go uh, continue on to your presentation. Okay, so I'm just going to jump right in and open the presentation because my <laughs> my introduction to myself is part of the presentation. So uh, my name is Susan Vanek. Uh, I am an anthropologist. I did my uh, master's at University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I had done my initial research in Alaska. And um, broadly, I focus on the Arctic region, primarily in Alaska, and then in recent years in Greenland. And my work, foc my current work focuses on infrastructural development. It's part of the Infra North project. It's funded by the EU out of University of Vienna. But my theoretical interest has always fallen within political economy or political ecology and policy. And it's in with, within these broader theoretical frameworks that have influenced uh, my research on disaster. So in this short presentation, I'm going to discuss some of the ways in which social scientists, particularly anthropologists, approach disaster, providing you with kind of a broad overview um, as an introduction and as some food for thought and discussion. And then by concluding with uh, research that a colleague, Yetta Rigo, out of University of Greenland and I had done in the aftermath of the 2017 tsunami in Carrot Fjord in Greenland. So short little background. So anthropology of disaster or disaster anthropology broadly focuses on um, disasters, not just as one-time extraordinary events, but instead as part of long-term intermeshed human and non-human processes. So as such, they expose the interconnection between the physical environment and socio-cultural, economic, and political landscapes that have taken shape over time. Although anthropology of disaster or disaster anthropology, sometimes called anthropology of risk, sometimes anthropology of hazard, it's all kind of interconnected. Um, it's a pretty well-established subfield now, particularly in applied anthropology. But this type of research is relatively new. It began to take shape in the 70s and 80s and then really coalesced in the 1990s around two separate but interconnected approaches which were vulnerability theory and a focus on disaster as revelatory crisis. So basically, vulnerability theory looked at disaster as a way to gauge human adaption to the environment. So how, particularly, uh, how particular practices or policies made communities more vulnerable to disasters. A uh, disaster as revelatory crisis examined how disasters would expose underlying contradictions in society and culture. So for example, the way certain practices of governing or manufacturing contributed condition to conditions that culminated in disaster and put certain populations at greater risk or how sometimes disasters themselves were used as scapegoats to promote certain policies and actions that led to further calamities. Both of these approaches and all disaster anthropology in general heavily relies on political economy, which just basically looks at the environmental impact of socioeconomic development. So like resource extraction or industrial production and how they're interconnected with larger issues of power. So to give you sort of a concrete example, if you were gonna look at the 20, uh, 2007, 2008 spike in global food prices, which was the largest food crisis since the 1973 to 1975 food crisis. From uh, a political economy perspective, you would look at the multitude of sort of interconnecting factors that contributed to this crisis. So not just things like drought or rather weather related events that were part of it, but also sort of structural adjust adjustment policies that pushed farmers away from staple crops like rice to more lucrative uh, global products. Uh, would look at things like the increase in demand of biofuel and how that changed farming and farming practices, as well as things like the consolidation of farms. So in general, when you, when you think about how anthropologists approach disaster, it's good to think about political economy or political ecology and sort of this nexus between social, cultural, economic, and political factors, and the environment and material conditions. So while vulnerability and disaster as revelatory crisis are kind of the foundations based within political ecology, these perspectives have a lot of limitations as well. 
So for example, vulnerability theory, whereas I think it's really interesting historically, it has a lot of problems in that it sort of would pick and choose different practices it was going to look at to determine if things were vulnerable or not. It also had a lot of moral judgment, even if it was unattended attached to it. So which communities were less vulnerable and which ones were were more prone because of different practices. Uh, and then disaster as a revelatory crisis, you get to the big question of for whom does the disaster reveal what? Like, what exactly are you looking at? So with this sort of basis, uh, does that, anthropological approaches to disaster in the 21st century broadly fall within four main categories. And these are all really interconnected. So those are perspectives on problemization, governance, uh, economics and neoliberalism, and science and technology studies. So to look at problemization, this work tends to focus on how certain phenomena are defined as hazards or disasters, how these are understood culturally, as well as how they're defined in law, policy, and economics. So for example, insurance companies are increasingly including climate change, including things like permafrost thaw, into their financial calculations. So this type of research would kind of look at, okay, so how are they quantifying what's meant by climate change? How is a monetary value put on this? And how who is included in these calculations? Who is excluded? What practices? Um, that type of thing. This also looks at disaster reduction and what this means in different contexts and to different communities. Focus on governance. Uh, this A lot of this relies on Foucault's notion of biopolitics and governmentality. And basically, it looks at disasters as things that are, take place across international boundaries and that their mitigation involves a multitude of different groups, as well as governments, non-governmental organizations, and international organizations. This line of research really focuses on interaction. So how disasters are, gov disasters are governed, how different groups are affected differently by particular state and international policies and how these groups come in inter uh, intersection with each other. So for example, if you looked at the recent earthquake this year in Turkey and Syria, this type of research would look at things as simple as how building codes exacerbated the crisis or how international policies as well as different governments allowed for aid to flow more freely into Turkey than it did into Syria. Uh, a further line of research is that of economics, particularly um, research that looks at neoliberalism. And this is uh, closely connected to the former. And it looks at how uh, changes in the global economic system uh, have created new and different connections between people, resources, and production and how these connections can lead to disaster or place different groups at risk. There was a lot of interesting work done in the wake of Hurricane Katrina that looked at the aftermath, like what basically put people in the situation of staying, uh, what happened in the aftermath, what happened in the recovery. So for example, one interesting study looked at how uh, for certain districts in New Orleans, uh, public housing was demolished and replaced with mixed income housing based on a cost benefit analysis that indicated that these former low income units didn't turn a profit, so they shouldn't be rebuilt. However, this determination failed to take into account how public services and subsidized housing supported the tourism industry with a lot of people that were lower income and service sec sector workers living in this housing that was now demolished and unavailable and they couldn't afford to remove into. So this impacted people that were really vulnerable as well as the recovery of the tourist industry. And then finally, science and technology studies. Science and technology studies is sort of a broad subdiscipline onto itself. But um, in terms of how disaster is approached from this perspective, it tends to look at this assumed split between what is natural on one side and what is cultural on the other. 
and how flame framing disasters as one or the other hides um, sort of the interconnection between the two. So for example, uh, there's been work in this research that has looked at forest fires and wildfires and how the intensity and the frequency of wildfires is really an intermix of human and environmental relations. So as people eradicate smaller fires and they move away from things like controlled burns and increasingly build in these places that are considered really aesthetically pleasing and really nice areas to live in, because they still have forests, there's an increasing uh, accumulation of combustible material, which not only raises the risk of fires, but also increases the intensity of those fires. So it's sort of looking at this interaction. So to sort of quickly sum up, if you're gonna look at disaster from an anthropological perspective, you're really looking at these human environmental relations overall. Uh, how they shape how we understand risk and hazard, how they contribute to disaster and the disproportionate effects on disparate communities, and then how disasters are part of these broader historical, political, economic, and social processes. So to give you an example from my own work of how we apply these sort of things, uh, Yeda Raigo and I um, had been in Ithlorswit as part of another project. Uh, right before the tsunami. And so we knew already a lot of people there and we were closely connected to, to what had happened. So on the 17th of June, 2017, the villages of Ithlorsuit and Nugatia in the Disco Bay area of Greenland, Greenland's west coast were hit by a tsunami. With the majority of houses in both villages lying close to the sea, Water inundated the majority of structures and several homes were pulled into the fjord, leaving four dead and several injured. Uh, now Lakasurisut, which is the government of Greenland, quickly responded with inhabitants evacuated to neighboring towns, uh, specifically Umanok, which has about 1,200 residents, and Asiat, which has about 3,100. While the tsunami itself was the start of the catastrophe, it was far from the end for those who were displaced. For months afterward, the former residents of Ithlorsuit and Nugatsiat waited for the government's determination on whether they would be able to return to their homes and what would happen. And it is this long wait and what contributed to it, how it was part of uh, longer historical patterns that we looked at for this project and what it told us about current policy and potential disaster response in the future. So to understand what happened and why people had to wait so long to know what was gonna to happen to their towns and their lives involves um, both historical uh, policies as well as sort of the contradictory images of the villages in Greenland. So Greenland was a colony uh, since 1721 and remained such until 1953 when it was incorporated into the Danish Commonwealth. At that time, the policy towards Greenland changed from one of isolation, where Greenland had much less access to goods or what was going on in the world, to massive modernization quickly. So within a 20 year time span, uh, massive construction projects were started that saw concrete apartment blocks built in most large population areas, the construction of roads, schools, hospitals, and medical facilities. This was a massive social upheaval in Greenland with a lot of people that had grown up primarily living hunting lifestyles and still occasionally living in sod houses now moved or um, their towns trans tra uh, transformed into ones with paved roads, grocery stores, cars, and large apartments. Part of this modernization also saw the closure of a lot of villages that were deemed unprofitable so too small to support the broader goals of development. Residents from these towns, most of which were very small and uh, were moved to larger cities. They lacked a lot of formal education. And when they got to the cities, they were unable to find employment. Some were housed in small industrial apartments 
and they were left in unfamiliar environments without access to the social networks that they had relied on in their small communities. This culminated into a lot of issues related to alcoholism, suicide, and other social problems. The aftermath of this closing of villages and this particular history has stuck with Greenland to the present. Greenland has had its own government since 1979 and enhanced self-government since 2009, which means decisions about Greenland are made within Greenland. But it remains politically untenable to talk about possibly closing towns, even in the aftermath of something like the tsunami. This sort of silence from the government is also exacerbated with the, the contradictory image of villages in Greenland. Whereas villages are often considered the real Greenland, sort of where people still have much more connection with nature, they have more access to hunting, they have this small sort of really closely connected village networks in life. They're also regarded as poor with no jobs and being a, an economic and social burden on the rest of the country. As Greenland has pushed to become more independent it remains tied to Denmark because of large block grants and subsidies that come from the Danish government. The priority in Greenland since the 70s, and especially since 2009, has been to expand and diversify the economy to become economic, uh, economically autonomous. But this has also created an atmosphere in which the villages are often seen as a burden. However, you have these sort of contradictory things happening where you can't talk about closing villages, but a lot of people outside of villages think they should possibly be closed. Which means for the people that were displaced by the tsunami, they were both skeptical of how the government was going to respond, but also were just completely uncertain. So they weren't weren't sure of what was going to happen and the government wasn't going to talk about it. Now we went into different government and policy documents and there is a policy for closing towns like Ithorsuit and Nugatsiat, especially in the wake of a disaster like that that happened. But nobody could talk about it. And then we did media analysis too of how the news approached it. And the news talked a lot about uh, recovering and unity in the country but no one discussed what was going to happen in general. So embedded within this sort of government response of silence, but also a policy of closure. Eventually, after about a year, uh, it was determined that people weren't going to be able to move back and both of these towns would be closed and the relocation would be permanent. But this, this lag in time affected how people organized their lives, their access to resources, and what was going to happen from that point on. So what this really told us was not only about what the government response is, but what the potential response is going to be to for, uh, future uh, displacements like that that happened in Ithorswit uh, and Nugatsia. Now, this is just one way to look at the situation. We only did minor research, but if you were going to look at this further, you could look at the historical situations that led to these communities being where they are. Both of these were fishing communities. Ithorsuit was only created about 150 years ago when uh, Nugatia was split in half. They were both directly placed on the water because of their connection to fishing. But you can also look at how risk is understood in these particular communities and in Greenland in general. Before we ever came to Ithorsuit, we were told land, it was prone to landslides. Like this is commonly known. People lived with this risk all the time. When we got there, people had, that had told us that the past winter, uh, four people had been killed snowmobiling because of issues that related to ice thaw. So there's a lot of different risks that people live with every day in these particular communities. So if you were going to really interrogate what was going on, you would look at these different types of risk and how people understand them, how they live with them every day and how they're culturally understood in the villages and in Greenland in general. 
So, and that's the kind of research that uh, anthropologists generally do when they talk about disaster. So thank you very much. I tried to keep it short. I was told 15 minutes. So I think I did 15 minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I, I'd like to I'd like to leave the recording going for you know some of our conversation here. Um, um, yeah, I, I, this is I've been very interested in this case study for a while. What happened with Nugatsiak and Elus? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Elusen. It's a Florswit. It's a if if you're familiar with the languages in Alaska, it has a barred L. It's the L with the little line through. It's that same sound. Um, and I I I wonder. So I, like what you, your description of how this is, uh, you know, something that was sort of off, like talking about this directly was sort of off the table. Um, I feel like, you know, we don't have the same situation in Alaska, but there are some parallels. Um, and we have, I mean, there's a history of like displaced communities, like um, King Islanders are the kind of the one I'm mm -hmm. most aware of. and. Um, and then there is active discussion of uh, communities moving, not not uh, completely merging with other communities typically, but usually moving. So, um, you know, Kivalina would be one example where they've they've built you know infrastructure on land and are kind of going through this gradual uh, process. So anyway, I, I but we don't really have any conversation I think around non-native communities moving. And so one of the questions that's been on my mind is what you know. Are we not? Is there is there a level at which, as a, a, you know, a, as a culture here in Alaska, that we're more comfortable imagining that Native communities uh, might have to uh, move than we are imagining that white communities would, or communities that are uh, non-Native? I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It's just I, I don't. I, I, I'm not sure if you have any any thoughts on that that aspect of it. I think oftentimes, uh, in, especially in the Alaska context, if you have non-Indigenous communities, they're kind of always assumed to be transplants. So they moved in so they could easily move out. And I think that sort of starts to forget the history of, these are people that have lived there for generations. So there is a connection to this place as different, but there's still a connection, you know? And I think there's a generally, there's a lot of assumptions that indigenous communities are interconnected with the land and non-indigenous communities are not. And I think that's a false assumption. So I think you kind of have to get into, into that. And I think there's also this, like, just because these were Greenlandic, small Greenlandic villages that were moved into relatively small Greenlandic towns, this did not go smoothly. There was a lot of bullying of kids that were moved into the the bigger schools. And I, I mean, we're talking about like, of course, it was about 77 people moving into Umanak, which is 1200. These are still small towns, but this is not an easy transition. So. Go for it, Kate. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I'm captivated by your work and I would love to learn more. Um, so thank you for coming here and sharing all of that with us. Um, my background is in uh, political science and international development. And so that's within the context of civil war specifically. So I, a lot of what you're saying really resonates in just a very different context. Um, and thinking about disasters, the way we talk about disasters is maybe this is a broad brush, so please correct me if this is incorrect, but um, just in terms of a reactionary or an interventionist or a postventionist framework. And I just wonder if that you see from where you sit and your knowledge, if you see opportunities for more of a prevention framework uh, around disaster and risk management, um, specifically when we're thinking about it from this political economy framework. I think, yes, I think the, the goal is usually something like to understand this better, to present, prevent it, or at least mitigate it in the future. Like this, this research has a utility. Um, 
but a lot of it at this point has been more reactionary, I think. So like anthropologists in general are presented with a situation of the disaster has happened. What do we learn from this? But I think the goal is then to sort of apply those lessons, you know. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I feel like part of the, one of the things that I've kind of realized I had assumptions about, and now that I've kind of trying to identify those and step back from them, I really don't know where to go with it exactly. But we, it seems like we, there is some sort of goal that we maybe often don't talk about. Like what is, what is it that when we talk about mitigation of disasters, about prevention of certain consequences, obviously some of the stuff that goes on is really undesirable. If we could prevent something like what just happened in Turkey or what happened in, 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 in Greenland in 2017, in, in some general sense, even though we maybe aren't specifying exactly what we mean by prevent or to what degree we're preventing it, that sounds like a pretty good thing to kind of prevent some of the horrors that we've seen. But I think that there's, you know, the goal, like even just confronting, well, that maybe maybe the goal of like zero death is not actually the goal, you know, um, and a lot of cultures actually live in, you know, including our own, you know, or including the most like urban lifestyles in the America with their their daily commutes, you know, people live in cultures that accept a certain amount of risk and understanding what is kind of a healthy relationship with disaster. I don't feel like I have a good understanding of that. I feel like it's something my whole career, I've been supposedly working on this problem and I really don't have a sense of an answer to it. And, and, I, and so that's one reason I'm really interested to hear social scientists kind of chewing on these topics is to try to understand it myself. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think, again, part of the goal is to kind of understand just how how people gauge certain risks within their own individual lives and then as communities. And then for me, I always look at policy. So it's sort of like, and then what policy could do to help sort of mitigate or how it exacerbates these potential risks and the hazards particular and it's always to particular groups you know so who's more at risk by particular policies who is not like how are these policies trying to shape the world in a specific way and for who but again that's sort of like my particular interest but um but i agree like these are these are and i i should say too i the way I grouped everything today was sort of thematically. You could also break this research up into like particular like researchers that have looked at the aftermath of tsunamis or researchers that have looked at earthquakes. Within this frame of disaster anthropology, it tends to collapse man-made disasters and like natural disasters together. So research on oil spills tend to fall within these categories too. So that, that's why I kind of, I grouped them thematically because I figured that gives you more to, to digest a little bit instead of pulling out. If you looked at risk in terms of uh, earthquakes versus risk in terms of oil spills, like it's sort of the same theoretical framework they're pull, both pulling on. I would be curious, Edna, if you'd be willing to, to, to sh I'm curious what your reactions are listening to this with your experience in the Philippines working with, you know, uh, disaster mitigation, um, landslide disaster mitigation. Um, thank you for calling me, calling me up. Um, it's actually pretty similar. I mean, uh, there are, there are um, certain or particular themes that can also be applied to the, that are also present in the Philippine context. And I'm actually surprised that these issues are systemic, you know, regardless of like, regardless of the socioeconomic status, you know, we are a developing country. We are a poor country. We have a lot of like, you know, poor people, but in Greenland is like, you know, um, a, a, a developed country, but you know, these themes, they're the same. <laughs> and it's actually, um, is it surprising? But, Actually, no, because again, being systemic, um, it it uh, regardless again, it 
it, it transcends like socioeconomic status regardless of the background of the people it's it's basically uh, it's it's the same so um we do experience that like the struggle of of the people and also like the government and if you see it from the political economy perspective it's uh, there are a lot of similarities and i guess i mean it's well is it no it's not nice it's like it's not a surprise so i guess these are wicked problems that actually need to be addressed but at the same time, it's a wicked problem. So there are many solutions to it. So yeah, basically it's yeah, there are many similarities across both um countries, which is yeah, which is nice. That's it. That's for me. I, I feel like some of what, what Susan was talking about at the as a huge factor was this power imbalance between these local communities and the the government that was you know responsible for making choices about the mitigation where where from what I remember you talking about Edna it seemed like there was some more community level collaboration in developing a mitigation strategy in the Philippines where um you know community members were, in. were you know kind of had front and center in how that what how that what actually happened they they were kind of given that responsibility whether <laughs> I don't know to what extent they wanted it but you know yeah um yes about that one it is somewhat like a small portion of the communities or like, you know, in the general population, only a small um, population of the Philippines is actually involved in doing these like community-based um, participatory um, research. But also as a whole, you know, majority, most of them, you know, there's still like um, the people in office or the decision or the policymakers are actually the one being, um, uh, are the ones who are, have the call. Um, it's only in certain um, areas or certain um, populations in the Philippines who are affected by disasters that actually have a say in in um, in what they want to be. But bottom line is, um, it's 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 there's still that um, Im power imbalance among um, the affected people in the Philippines. Yeah, but I think in terms of like disaster risk research and also like a lot of um organizations coming in, um, uh, sharing their knowledge and also their strategies in disaster risk reduction, we have quite a lot of that in the Philippines. That's why I think um in terms of like um programs, uh, in um getting the communities involved, there are quite a number, but still it is a small portion, um, compared to the whole, but there are like, you know, um, interventions from organizations where the communities are involved. Anna? Yeah, thank you, Susan, so much. It's uh, <laughs> there's so much information in your words. And I'm curious, so you, you mentioned you had the first disaster, which was the the landslide itself and, and the, the death and the injuries that happened immediately. And then you had the second disaster, which was how the social system responded to this and how people were affected by that response. How, from the from what you've learned and you've observed in this case where you have Greenland being run by people in Denmark, <laughs> and this is a small community, um, how would the decision tree or the social political system look like in order to, to to really minimize and maybe even eliminate this second disaster. Uh, um, for the for the history section, remember Gre Greenland at this point has a semi-autonomous government, so it is Greenlanders that are making decisions about Greenland. With with Nook being the capital, like Greenland has its own parliament, so. I think if you were going to look at it, you'd have to look at just sort of not an outside government outside of Greenland making these decisions, but how the government in Greenland is making these decisions. And I think it's, in general, it's a policy of neglect, like hope the problems in the villages kind of go away. Like Greenland is, my, like all of the Arctic is urbanizing. Almost all the small villages in Greenland are slowly flowing into bigger towns, which are slowly flowing into the cities. Just in um, the, la remember, Greenland has about 56,000 people in it currently. 
uh, very few places in Greenland are growing. One of the ones that has the largest growth is here in Nook. Nook has almost 20,000 people now. This has grown by, a, when I first started doing research in Greenland about 10 years ago, there was only about 16,000 people. So that's a pretty big influx. And most of it is in migration from other parts of Greenland. So issues related to the villages, especially the very small ones, it's just sort of just waiting for it to go away, you know? And there's so many other issues going on in the country. Like the parliament here is 31 people. Like it is a very small government. There are no roads that connect towns in Greenland. None of them. Everybody's connected either by boat or plane. Uh, Greenland is really, and there there's a lot of political issues that feed into this, but there's really been a focus on trying to get some some sort of large economic development. A lot of that has focused on extractive industries, but none of that has really worked out. So the focus now has become on things like tourism and increasing access. And in 2015, the Greenlandic government passed a big package to expand the airports. It's gonna make two new international airports and one new regional airport. That doesn't sound like so much, but that is a huge uh, amount of money that Greenland is spending for this. So that and focusing on increasing the the tourism and stuff going into these towns and cities is what the, the government really is focused on. So the villages kind of get pushed to the wayside. Like you have to increase focus on them before you can really get some sort of policy, I think that would work. But that really requires an open dialogue that nobody really wants to have. Like, no, it's so. not, it's not one to one, but there's so many similarities with Alaska, right? I mean, the fact that you have more than half of the population basically sitting in one population center. Um, creates a really odd power balance between rural and 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 and, uh, and urban areas. Also, the concentration on extractive industries and sort of a re refusal to think as a state where we want to head <laughs> once that dries out. And I don't know, I just see a lot of, I mean, there's other issues in Greenland that are not applicable here and, and vice versa, but there's a lot of commonality as well um, between this state. And same with like the pressures, like in, you know, the Ilulisat, the new runway coming to Ilulisat and the, the potential amount of tourism pressure on that town is just phenomenal. And there's no infrastructure there to handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even here in Nook, like yeah. they're slowly building more hotels and things, but if they get the influx they want, I don't know how the town will deal with it. Like Nook, the the municipality wants to have 30,000 people in Nook by 2030. In order to, and there's already a housing crunch here. The roads already have traffic, like they're increasing the hydropower plant, but there there is a lot of pressure in this one place. There are plans to expand Nook, but in order to do that, they have to do Blake they blast through a mountain to build a new section. So that isn't going to start within the next five years. So they're densifying the city. There is construction cranes all over the place. But again, that creates sort of this very dense, tight sort of powder keg situation of how this will accommodate not just the people moving in here from other parts of Greenland, let alone the tourists that might come in here. But I can sympathize with government a little bit because I'm I'm not at a high level of government, but I am in government. And when when we deal with disasters where we have to evacuate a community or something like that, like the immediate solutions are are usually pretty easy. But you have to remember also that 
at every level of government, they're just people and they, they have to make decisions as well, right? And, and, and they have to answer to each other. But, but yeah, so, so like making a decision about a town, whether to abandon it permanently or, or to, you know, to assess the hazards more fully or, or to do some mitigation or adaptation, those can be very non-trivial things to, to decide. So, so it's, you know, and, and it's true, the priorities might not be for that community when you have other things going on but but it's also not easy like any of us could be thrust into those positions right and if we were faced with making those decisions it, we would all have a difficult time i think so and but, I, I think a lot of these decisions are not necessarily just rational right they might be rationally the most and that applies at all scales. You know, you can you, you can apply that to New Orleans if you want. You know, after Katrina, <laughs> mm -hmm. people still want to go back, right? And then, I think that happens at every scale. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the the kind of conversation we've been having in this group for you know for quite a while now about you know how to apply co design. Uh, um, Kind of frameworks in order to try to address paraglacial landslide or you know landslide hazard climate link landslide hazards in, in, in alaska and elsewhere the mitigation of those hazards i uh i feel like that um it, to, you know in my mind i've i've been I, i'm very interested to look at that as it's not the only and complete solution but that it is a genuine partial solution here uh, that we can can start like I, I've looked at some of the issues I've seen arising and then if I just kind of put on my co-design glasses and look at it I'm like oh we really didn't do that did we <laughs> you know like this was something we just totally neglected there wasn't a process where um, the community was integral to um, the action from the start and that we were that the process was open to hearing those community perspectives. Now, in in kind of emer emergency response, seems like an, a whole other set of challenges come into play, uh, you know, and and um, and so that's one reason why that kind of preventive mindset is is maybe really helpful if we are actually going in and having these conversations ahead of time. Um, that maybe maybe we can we can do better there. But I do look at places like Whittier, where it's it's uh, I don't know just the the number of different challenges there with how to like even figure out what what communities we're even talking about. You know, there's you know there's the tourist ind industry as a community. Um, there are people coming from Anchorage to get in their boat in Whittier and do you know, commercial or, or sports fishing. There's um, the South Pacific Islanders who have a, you know, a community that that is, you know, centered very much on their on their church in in uh, Begich Tower in 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 Whittier. Like these are all very, very different communities. And if we talk about like moving forward with a, a real conversation, uh, you know, a real collaboration with with a potentially affected communities in order to take appropriate mitigating actions, it, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging to, to figure out what, what that means. And we have, you know, we have Aaron Chu and, and Paul here who are, you know, are, can kind of represent certain facets of a broader community that, in, you know, has its connections to Whittier, but to the broader region. And I think that's a good way to kind of start on that. But, uh, but yeah, I'm still very puzzled. Uh, you know, I, I think it's I think it's a challenge totally worth tackling, but uh, it, it is it is very very difficult in my mind a difficult challenge of how we how we extend. You know, we can look to to mistakes that are made in places that you know like Nugatsiak, um and maybe learn from those to some extent. But I think they're still still even defining the challenge is difficult for me.
I don't know if that made any sense, but <laughs> I, I think with my mouth open. Go for it, Susan. <laughs> I, I, no, because I, I don't think it is not just difficult for you. It is difficult for everybody, like especially like in defining what a community is and then getting make sure to get as many people involved as possible, like for um, a different research project, the one that actually brought us there, but has nothing to do with uh, disaster or anything. Uh, we really tried to have as much community engagement as possible, like contacting people ahead of time, holding community meetings in advance, going back, putting this into research design, coming back, and you still wind up leaving people out. Like you don't mean to, but it happens. And the bigger the communities get, the harder it is to reach people. Like at Thorsuit, if we had a community meeting, most of the community came because there was nothing else happening. But in places like Nook, if we have a community meeting, we'll get a handful of people, half of them that already know us, so they're coming for us. But there's so many other things happening. Even in like medium kind of sized towns like Systemute, we can't get everybody. Like we try to advertise on the local radio. We try to hang up flyers and bus stops, all the ways you can think of to try to get people's attention. And it, you still run into this problem. So it's not just you, <laughs> I think it's everybody. I think that, you know, one, I remember a couple of meetings ago, Martin Geertzma met and brought up, uh, you know, that there's another side to this also that when you start, when you're in really small communities, you might be able to connect with them as a whole community more easily, but it is more difficult for them to, to kind of marshal the leadership resources to be actively and continuously engaged in the whole, whole spectrum of possible problems, which we're talking about, well, maybe not one, but a very small range of those in this group about these kind of climate linked landslide hazards. Um, you know, and, and, and so when we're just, just focusing on that, it seems like, well, maybe, you know, there should be, you know, some way that this community is engaging really intensively with this, this topic and, and, you know, some, and we've gotten some of that engagement, but at some level, I feel like uh, when we're talking about communities that are, you know, some hundreds of people or less, then it really isn't reasonable to expect the level of engagement that could lead to, you know, a fully informed kind of decision making process and planning process. Within these smaller communities. I think you also have to deal with different kind of dynamics of power, like especially in the Alaska context, I've seen this more, but you kind of tend to have like one or two families that basically they run the shop, they run everything like they have the loudest voice because of their position. And that means other people tend to stay quiet or not be part of things. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording there unless someone wants to throw in like some closing thought 